2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. It says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Did you notice there it said always leads us in triumph in Christ? And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Verse 15, it says, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to to death, and to another, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. And God, it's our prayer to be more like you. Lord, as we're saying this morning, we want to build our lives, God, on the foundation of you, Jesus, and your word. God, would you do that this morning, right upon our hearts, Lord. Make our hearts ready to receive your word, Lord, and bear fruit, Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. It has been said over the years, if you really desire to make God laugh, make your own plans. <laughs> and those of you who are laughing perhaps have made your own plans and have recognized that God had a different plan for you. The Apostle Paul had made good and honorable plans that was by telling the Corinthian Christians that he would come and he would visit them if the Lord permitted but because the Lord did not permit the apostle to come at a specific time, the many or many in the Corinthian church blamed Paul and called him untrustworthy. In fact, it is recorded in Acts chapter 19 and chapter 20 that after Paul left the city of Ephesus, he came to Troas, and while he was in Troas, he was waiting for Titus, whom he had sent with a letter to this church in Corinth, and many people believe, and many scholars call this a severe letter. It was a letter that was different from the letter of 1 Corinthians, in which was filled with correction. It, ten- it evidently was more severe and more harsh, and it was important that Titus delivered this letter because it demanded the Corinthian church to repent and turn and follow Jesus. And Paul would send Titus down to Corinth, And this severe letter, as he sent this severe letter with Titus down to Corinth, things didn't pan out very well for Paul as he waited in Troas for Titus to come. Evidently, Titus does not come back, and Paul had to continue on with his plans. And rather than coming to Corinth quickly, he went from Troas to Miletus to meet with the Ephesian elders. And then from Miletus, he moved to Judea for the feast. And then, once again, some of the Corinthians said, well, we can't trust Paul because he's not true to his word. And thus, once again, Paul goes on to explain in this passage the change of his plans. You even find in this passage, in the next verse, in verse 12, Paul noted that his plans changed so quickly, he even had to forego opportunity for ministry. Notice what it says in verse 12. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel. And by the way, there is no other gospel that needs to be preached other than Christ's gospel. He says, a door was opened to me by the Lord. Now, because Paul is not exactly clear on what open door he is speaking of, we cannot say for certainty what he is speaking of. But the situation that he kind of alludes to, gives us, and maybe it's possible that it was the situation that was taking place in Acts chapter 20. 
In fact, when Paul was in Troas in Acts chapter 20, it's recorded for us, and this is where some people speculate the open door. While he was in Troas, it says on the first day of the week, it was on Sunday, the disciples were together, they were breaking bread, and as they were there together, it says that Paul continued his message till midnight. It was a long sermon, in other words. And he's preaching, and it says that there in the window sat a certain young man by the name of Eutychus. And I love the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, I love how the Holy Spirit, when, when, he, when, when he told Luke what to write, he doesn't blame Paul's message. He says, the Holy Spirit says that there was a lot of lamps in the room. Now, if you've ever changed a light bulb, I, the other day I was changing these old light bulbs in our house, and I realized, I was like, I, after I had it on for about a minute, it was just super hot to the touch. It gives out heat. Now, keep in mind, of this day, there's no light bulbs. It's all lamps. They're all, it's just, it says that there were several lamps that were on fire in the room, and so there was a, in other words, it was extremely hot, and there was a man that sat in the window by the name of Eutychus, and they were three floors up. And it says that as Paul continued his message, he continued speaking, it says that this man Eutychus fell from the third floor down and he fell out of the window while Paul's preaching. Now, as Paul sees this, he goes down and says that he embraces him, picks him up, and it says that he went back up. He says, don't trouble yourselves. And it says that they went back up, they talked, they ate, and it says that they brought the young man up alive. Now, if this were to take place, and we know that it does, the Bible records it, and this takes place, they bring this young man up, and there would be a crowd gathering outside where this man would fall, have fallen outside of the window, and Paul, they would be demanding an explanation to how did this happen? How did this man fall out of a three-story three window? We saw him dead. You picked him back up. He raised to life. How did this happen? Paul would have evidently had an open door for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is one speculation into what was possibly the open door that Paul speaks of. But Paul goes on and he tells us why his plans changed in the next few verses by using an illustration from the Roman world to bring understanding to the Corinthians. Notice at the beginning of verse 14. He says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Now that word triumph there is what Paul is referencing, a Roman ceremony that would take place called the Roman triumph or a Roman triumphal procession. And what would happen was a general would be celebrated in victory over his enemies. And they would have this, they would be celebrated by this triumphal procession. And the only way a general could have this celebration or this processional take place is they had to be one, a Roman general or a commander in chief. They had to start a battle, but they also had to finish the battle. They had to kill at least 5,000 members of the enemy. And then Roman territory had to be expanded in the process of this battle. And then when they would arrive back in Rome, they would throw this huge processional called a Roman processional in which they would march down through the main corridor of the city. And then they would come and they would end at, the, at a place called the Circus Maximus. It was a huge sports facility. And within this processional, they had a very strict order. First would come the state officials and the Senate, and then they would come the trumpeters to let all the people know that this was taking place. And then they would carry in the spoils taken from the conquered land. And then, this, get this, they would, go, they would send people, they would send artists over, and they would draw pictures and paintings of the land that they had conquered. And then they would so, send people to make models of the ships that they conquered or the citadels that they would conquer, and then they would carry those things in this Roman processional. After that, they would have a white bull for sacrifice, and then they would take and bring in the captives that they had taken, the princes, the leaders, the other generals, and then they would either be flung into prison or swiftly executed. 
And then would come more musicians alerting the people that this is an important part. And then the priests would come in and they would, have, they would be carrying these uh, incense burners and they would swing them so that the scent of victory would go all around. And everybody that smelled it would understand that the Rome had triumphed over their enemies. And then after that, the general himself came, followed by the army, wearing all their decorations and shouting triumph. And Paul is saying here, in the application, he's saying, listen, Jesus Christ is our general. He's the captain of our salvation. And because Jesus triumphed at the cross, Jesus set the captives free, and he's bringing many sons to glory, and he's leading us in this triumphal entry, not to the circus, but to the kingdom. And Paul's saying, listen, he's leading me into triumph. And although the Corinthians were upset about Paul's plans that had fallen apart or being changed, Paul says, listen, I'm following my general, my commander, and my king. And where he goes, he says, I'm going to follow, and I'm confident that where Jesus goes and where, where he calls me to, I'm going to triumph because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Friend, can I ask you this morning, perhaps you have had plans that have changed. Perhaps like Paul, you thought, you know what, I planned it this way. I thought things were going to happen this way. Perhaps you've had plans that have failed. Perhaps you've had future plans that have fallen apart. Maybe you've had a plan to heal in a certain way. Maybe you had a plan to overcome sin by a certain method or whatever the case may be. Here's, here's what you need to do. The Bible says to fix your eyes on the author and the finisher of your faith. You need to fix your eyes upon Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation. And it is there when you fix your eyes upon Jesus and you follow Jesus that direction, he leads you into triumph. Amen? This is where, this is the direction we need to go. We need to follow Jesus in that way. And it is only because of the work of the cross of Jesus Christ that we triumph. And we can enter into his triumph. Thus it is imperative that we follow Jesus and his leading. Amen? Now as we continue on, you notice there in verse 14, Paul continues on with this Roman illustration. And he says, through us, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now, we keep in mind that the Corinthians still had a strong distrust for the Apostle Paul. And knowing that and living with that pressure, Paul could still confidently tell the Corinthians that he says, my service before the Lord is a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, as we mentioned earlier, in this Roman processional march, the priests would swing their censers, and it would be a sweet-smelling incense burning within that, and everybody nearby would smell the fragrance, and to the citizens of Rome, it was the aroma of victory. It was the aroma of life and leading to life. And for you and I, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1 that he has loved us, speaking of Jesus, and he has washed us of our sins in, by his own blood. And it says because Jesus has done that, he has made us kings and priests. First Peter tells us in First Peter chapter 2 that we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Thus, God has called you and I to be the fragrance of the triumph of Jesus Christ over sin and death to this world. And one of the questions I think that we have to ask ourselves is whether things are going to our plan or not going according to our plan, are we diffusing the fragrance of his knowledge in every place? Or wherever we go, are people asking us, hey, I, I don't know what it is about you. I noticed something different about what, what is that? What is that aroma? Friend, that's Jesus Christ. And he's died for me. He's washed me of my sin. He's forgiven me. What, and you, you go to different places. And, you know, there's, just, there's something about you. Your face is shining. I don't know what it is about you. It's Jesus. Jesus has forgiven me. He's given me life and life everlasting. And friend, this is the thing that is that God has called us to do is to be the fragrance of Christ. People are going to ask you, you know, I, I can't put my finger on it. 
What exactly is different about you? I know that my Redeemer lives, and He has washed me, and He has cleansed me of my sin. To some, that is the aroma of life, but to others, notice what it says in verse 16. It says, to one it is the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other it's the aroma of life leading to life. And he says, who is sufficient for these things? Now, keep in mind, the scent of incense in this day, in the Roman day, burnt to the gods there in Rome, smelled wonderful to the citizen of Rome. The same aroma was an awful smell to a captive prisoner of war in a parade who was soon to be executed or sold into slavery. And while the fragrance of Christ may be a wonderful smell to the citizen of heaven, to someone who has rejected Christ, it is the aroma of death. You know, there, you, may be, you may go to places and perhaps you go to family reunions. And you know, there's, this, there's one family member that's just somehow upset that you're a Christian. And they walk in with an attitude. You know, I, you know I've been to family reunions where somebody walks in and just, oh, all these Christians, just... They stink. All their joy and kindness and love. You know, you just, they just, and they develop a bad attitude about people being kind and loving and joyful. And you just, they just, they're just grumble. They sit in the corner, you know, and just, it, it, why is that? Because it's the aroma of death. And friend, maybe if, the, if you, if when you come into the Christian circles and you're around people that are believers, and all you can think about is the smell of death. Perhaps that's your death sentence. If, friend, you need to repent and you need to follow Jesus. Listen, the Bible says that if you continue to reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the, there is an eternity waiting for you after death in which you will be separated from the love of God in hell. But the wonderful news is that Jesus died for your sins, and if you bow your knee to the Savior, you repent of your sin, and you follow Jesus, he will give you life and life everlasting. And listen, I encourage you, if you, if this, if you walk in and you're just like, man, all these believers, the Bible says to examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. And you need to check and you need to ask the Lord. But listen, if you are continually, willfully rejecting Jesus, listen, my encouragement to you is not to reject the love of God, but to accept the love of God and follow him. Now, as we continue on, Paul continues his defense and his reminder to these Corinthians that he was not untrustworthy. Notice what he says in verse 17. He says, for we are not as so many. Notice what he says, peddling the word of God. He says, but as of sincerity, but as of or but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Apparently, the Corinthians were still accusing Paul of peddling God's word in order to make a profit off of the word of God. You know, and, you know, our minds immediately go to those infomercials that sometimes you've seen, you know, where there's somebody on there and they're trying to sell you their holy water, you know, for four easy payments of... 995, you can have holy water that will heal you, you know, or whatever. You know, I, listen, we've, I've seen it all. Holy hankies. Um, I've had people wave them at me. And I just, like, if you've used that, please don't wave that at me. You know, you don't need to. You, that's unnecessary. You know, and there's, you, know I, there, you, you see these guys and they sell these holy wallets. And they just, they say, you know, if you buy my wallet, the Lord will bless your finances. And the Lord's going to fill the wallet. And, and you, you laugh, but it's like, and I think to myself, if it really works, why, do you, why are you selling it to me? You know, why do you need my 10 bucks for that? But it just, it is the reality of the world which we live in. And we have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. But Paul here says specifically that their accusation was, against Paul peddling the word of God. If you want to write in your margin there next to that word peddling, the actual translation is huckster. It was a huckster who would peddle the word of God for profit. And I think it's interesting because the word peddling carries the idea of adulterating or watering down. 
Because oftentimes what would happen would, would be is that a huckster or someone who would peddle, and it oftentimes would be used uh, for someone who would sell wine, what they would do is they would come and they would, they would divide two bottles of wine, or divide a bottle of wine into two different bottles, and then they would add water to the wine, watering down, essentially. And essentially, this is what they were accusing Paul of doing. They say, hey, listen, he waters down the word of God for profit. Listen, there are a ton. There, listen, there are great churches in our city. And I want to be clear. I'm not, I don't want to sound like a young pastor who's church bashing and, you know, that kind of a thing. Hear me out. That's not my goal here. There are great churches in our city that teach and preach the word of God. And we pray for them. We prayed for them this morning in our prayer meeting. But there are a ton of churches out there who are willing to water down the purity of the word of God for profit. Paul says, listen, that wasn't me. He says, I taught you the counsel. I, went, I taught you the counsel of God. He says, I didn't, I didn't water down anything for you. I didn't, I didn't, nothing. He says, I went through the word of God. And oftentimes we see that where there are churches that will water down the word of God for cultural re relevancy or sensitivity. They say, we want to be sensitive to the speaker or to the seeker, which that means seeker sensitive. Uh, they don't want to make people uncomfortable. They don't want people to feel convicted. They have all these different reasons why they water down the word of God. And, you know, sometimes I hear, you know, I hear them, you know, they, someone will send me from another church and they'll send me their pastor's message and say, hey, can you listen to this and tell me what you think about this? And one of the things I've heard so frequently is this social justice gospel, where it's just like, you know, they will oftentimes take the gospel and they seek to apply Christian ethics to social problems such as poverty or lack of education, alcoholism, crime, addiction, whatever it may be. And these things are important issues in our society, but if they become the, the emphasis of the message without preaching on the doctrine of sin, salvation, heaven and hell, future kingdom of God, all these things oftentimes are downplayed. Listen, we're not truly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says there's only one gospel. He says, I preached to you the gospel and I didn't water down the word of God. He says, I went through it with you. And listen, we have to be careful. One of the things, and listen, this is my prayer as our church and for each one of us individually, as Paul would say to the Romans, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. Friend, it's through the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of morality, not the gospel of social justice, all these different things. Listen, many of them are important, but listen, they pale in comparison to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, we, could, we can feed the poor, and listen, we can do all these things, but if we clothe them and they still go to hell, what profit is it? We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says that is the power of God unto salvation. Friend, there is a need in our day for churches to be ready in season and out of season to preach the word and share the message of Jesus Christ. That is the power of God. Amen? Now, as we move on, keep in mind that there, when Paul wrote this letter, there was no verse numbers or dividing chapter. Thus, we continue Paul's thought into chapter 3. Notice what it says in verse 1. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some other epistles, of commendation to you or to the letters of commendation from you? Verse 2, he says, you are our epistle. You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. In verse 4, he says, but we have such a trust through Christ toward God that we are not sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. 
But our sufficiency is from God who made us sufficient as ministers or servants of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills and the spirit gives life. Now, Paul tells us again, as we continue this same idea of Paul defending his ministry before the Corinthians, in verse 1, he says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Now, in this day, what was common is that there were false preachers and false teachers that would go around to various churches, and they would go around and they would say, hey, so-and-so sent me, uh, would, you, would you let me speak to the church and ask for support? And some of them were false prophets. Some of them were false teachers. Some of them were false apostles. And they were going around. So what was common of that day, keep in mind, there's no way to, Paul could not text James or Peter and ask them, hey, what do you think about this guy? So what they would do is they would would send this letter, and it was much like a letter of ordination. And then one of the other apostles would sign it and say, hey, we recommend this man to you. And Paul essentially says, listen, they were, Paul, they, the Corinthians were saying, hey, Paul, do you have a letter of recommendation? Now, keep in mind, Paul planted the church. The church was growing. The church was, was growing towards, and they were following Jesus Christ. They had repented, but they asked Paul, said, hey, do you have a letter of recommendation? Notice what Paul says to this in verse 2. He says, you are our epistle written in our hearts known and read by all men. And he says, clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is the heart. As the Corinthians distrusted the apostle Paul, they requested something similar to a letter of ordination. And Paul says, listen, if you want my letter, Here's my letter. You're my letter. You're my letter of recommendation. And he says, my letter of recommendation, he says, it's not written in ink on tablets or on paper. He says, it's written by the Spirit of God upon your hearts. And one of the things I think this verse teaches us when we look at it is the impact and the full force of the power that is unleashed when the purity of the Word of God is preached and not watered down. The Bible tells us, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul would write to him and he would say, all scripture is given by inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be a thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, when the word of God is taught, not in a way that's watered down, the spirit of God begins to carve out the principles of the word of God upon our hearts. And that's why we place a huge priority at our church on the teaching and the studying of the word of God. Because we want God to write by the power of the Holy Spirit upon your heart the principles of the word of God and for the Holy Spirit to lead you into truth. Not just when you come here, but when you leave this place throughout the week that you walk in the truth of God's word. And it's done by the Holy Spirit writing upon your heart. You know, over the years, especially when we were young, when we were, when we first got here, when the church was real small, I remember there was on one occasion... I think there was, uh, there was a big, big turnout. I mean, I think there was, besides my family, there was like three people. It was, it was wild. We didn't know what to do. And, um, and after the service, someone came up to me, and one of the three, and they said, um, hey, I don't mean to be rude, but have you ever thought about marketing? And I... And, I, and, I, and, and I've gotten this question over the years, and I, and I always, to answer that question... I always say God's business is different from the business of the world. And here's why. Because we're not trusting on words written on billboards. We're trusting in the word of God written upon your hearts. And to go forth and to continue to walk in the spirit. And so when someone says, hey, how did, what changed in your life? I, I've been going to this church where they teach the word of God. It's not watered down. They preach the gospel message. Oh, 
That's wild. And then over the years, God did what he did. And we, tr we trusted in the Lord and the power of the word of God going forth and changing lives. And it's been a wonderful testament to the power of the Holy Spirit when the word of God is taught. Listen, we can build the house in flesh upon the sand, but when the storm comes, it's going to wash away. But if we build the house, or if the Lord builds the house, I should say, upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and his word, when the storm comes, listen, it's not going anywhere. And that's our prayer, is that the Lord would continue to build upon the build his house upon the foundation of Jesus Christ and his word. Now, as we finish up here in verse four, it says, we have seen such trust, or sorry, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. In verse five, he says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He says, who has made us sufficient ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills and the spirit gives life. Even though the apostle Paul planted the church and aided in the spiritual growth of the church, the church was still, in a, or the church was in a sense a letter of authentic authenticating Paul's apostleship and his ministry, but Paul recognized it was ultimately the Lord who did the work. There's an old saying that says, give credit where credit is due. And this is exactly what the apostle Paul was doing in describing the effect of changed lives in the Corinthian church through his ministry. He says, listen, I may have come and I may have planted the church, but ultimately, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I came and I taught the word of God. But it was Jesus. Jesus is the one in which our sufficiency is. Jesus is the one who my source is. And listen, there's a lot of people that do a lot of things here. They minister, they serve, and I'm so thankful. And look, there's the important thing is that we recognize that it's a work of God. It's Jesus. Our sufficiency is in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's our source. You notice there in verse six, Paul says, he has made us sufficient as servants or ministers of the new covenant. You remember when Jesus instituted communion, he said, this is my body that was broken for you, and he took the bread and he broke it. And it was after that, he passed the cup. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. And you remember when he did that, he says, this is, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And I think the thing that we must remember as we come to this passage is the fact that our sufficiency is in the blood of Jesus Christ apart from the blood, apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Jesus said, abide in me, for without me you can do nothing. And this morning we want to remember that in communion. We want to remember the sufficiency that Jesus offers each one of us because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I was thinking the other day, how many times over the years, I've come and I've said, Lord, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is a task that I, YouTube tutorials don't even cover this. How does this, how are you going to do this? And I'm always reminded, Paul would say to the Corinthians later, my grace is sufficient for you. In in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. And maybe you've come this morning, you've thought, I don't know how I'm going to move forward. I don't know how the Lord's going to conquer this. I don't see, I know the Lord triumph, but I don't know how he's going to lead me into triumph. This is where we start. Remembering the broken body of Jesus. 
remembering the blood of Jesus Christ that he offers to each one of us. And as I was thinking about that over the years, every time I prayed, Lord, I need you. God has always been faithful to provide what I needed. Every time. I think, Lord, I can't do this. I don't know how, I don't know. The Lord's faithfulness shows up every single time and he is sufficient for us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you for your body. Lord, we want to remember that. Lord, we want to look to you. We're humbling ourselves, Lord. Our hearts are bowed low to your majesty and to your power, God. Lord, be sufficient for us. Lord, it's your grace that we're looking to at the cross. Thank you for extending that to us, Lord, from your throne in our time of need. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. The men are going to come forward and distribute the elements. If you would, hold the, your portion until uh, after the song, and we'll partake together.